quite okay for us to not maybe have that kind of communication. But I'm sure everyone agrees that we should be able, as the committee, to get a better way to communicate with each other so that we don't actually drop the decorum of the committee to a level where we actually don't respect each other. Bottom line is respect. Can I actually ask Ms. Pearson and ask uh, Mantashe just to talk to us with the suggestion which I put forward? Ms. Pearson. Chair, <laughs> with, with respect, you cannot ask me to apologize for requesting a vote on an issue and then being repeatedly ignored on that and continuously asking a question. So with due respect, I, I cannot uh, apologize for uh, trying to exercise uh, my rights on this issue. It, so, uh, is not yeah. what you were talking, Mapheson, is not what you were talking about. It's how you raise the point. I'm just saying, so that you can understand what I'm raising as a point. I think it's the same point that we're raising as well uh, on the other side, because on my part, you got an opportunity. And in fact, you were not the person where we can say you are the best member of parliament on how you behave. And on my part, having actually allowed you to, to raise a point which is not on the agenda, I think uh, the way you actually have behaved did not help the meeting. So I think that's the point I'm raising. It's not what you raise, it's how you raised it. So I think uh, if you don't want to apologize, it's fine. Because I know the kind of attitude you do have, then we can actually proceed. Maybe one will try and actually communicate in a way where I can make sense when I actually engage with you at the same level. But on my part, I think it was unacceptable. It's not what you were raising, but how you did it. Because you continued interrupting. So as a chair, I did try the best I could, but you are not helpful to me as a chair of the committee. That's why I ask you as a chair to actually uh, apologize. But if you don't want to, I don't have a problem. Uh, Honorable Mantashe, can I actually then ask you to talk to us so we can then move to the next item on the agenda? But I thought, let me raise these issues because it's quite important. I may not be actually the, be the best person. That's why I'm trying to actually use different languages. It's much easier on my language in English. I might end up actually creating even a worse situation. But uh, in Zulu, I'm confident that I'll be able to explain things in the way that respects others, keep the decorum of the house. Mantashe, Aziz was this. Chairperson, I, I rise to apologize, Che. It's like when it's, it's correct when you say some things sound ugly in some languages, because if I had read this in my own language, it wouldn't be perceived in the manner it is perceived in this house. And with that, as it may I, I unreservedly apologize if it has had some people. Uh, for the sake of progress, Chairperson, I propose that my yeah. apology yeah. be accepted. Okay. No, sir, Bonga Bantashi, Mama Minis will be getting a sister with it. You, Ula Golungaga, who sees who got this way in Ganga. So, in our yard, eh, in some villages into the machine. Nothing in Yega Lapone. So, can I then actually uh, ask us to proceed to the next item on the agenda? Uh, I think uh, the points I've raised as the comments from my side as a chair are understood by members. And I think for those who have actually responded, we accept uh, your apologies. We accept that you don't want to apologize as well because you think you've been abused. It's well and good. We can then pick up the next item on the agenda. Uh, Andre? Chair, we, the item on the agenda is uh, to get, receive a briefing from the IDC. The IDC, we had the, uh, Mr. Jarvis is going to pre um, present the the, he's not making the presentation. The CEO will do that, Chair, but he will be managing the, the um, presentation. Okay. So we, we actually do have a delegation from the IDC led by Mr. Jarvis. Let's also say that there might be officials that are here as well uh, attending on, uh, from the department. Let's actually then welcome everyone who have actually come through. Uh, I would like just to speak to the purpose of today's meeting. Um, as the part of the oversight of 
over the entities of the department uh, and their short and long-term contribution to assist in the mitigation uh, of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, the committee will be receiving briefings from the Industrial Development Corporation and the National Empowerment Fund. The IDC has been reported to be administering a 500 million for the COVID-19 essential supplies intervention and managing the manufacturing competitiveness enhancement COVID-19 distress company program, which has been allocated as 700 million immediately and will receive 3 billion rands in the next fiscal quarter. The NEF was responsible for the allocating and distribution of 200 million rands for black entrepreneurs to manufacture essential goods. Furthermore, as each of these development finance institutions supply support company, they play a role in offering mentorship and support programs for their clients in distress. Can I say th those are main points which I thought were quite important to raise uh, in anticipation of the presentation. Can I then actually uh, hand over to uh, Mr. Jarvis and the team and you can acknowledge all those who have been in attendance from the entities and the officials, uh, media will be there. Obviously, everyone is welcome. Floor is yours, Mr. Chair, Jarvis. Chair, just to note, Mr. Jarvis is not leading the delegation. He's the CEO, Mr. Noncho. He will be leading the delegation and the presentation, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. CEO? <laughs> Uh, Chairperson of the committee, members of the committee, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tsokolo uh, Petros, the Chief Executive Officer of the IDC. And, good uh, afternoon, yes, that's in charge of. Uh, uh, as uh, has been indicated, I'm with my colleague, uh, David Jarvis. Uh, he's the Executive for Strategy and Corporate Affairs at the IDC, uh, together with uh, uh, Gerald Tinonetsana, he's uh, uh, our colleague and manager at the IDC. Uh, chairperson, uh, just for me to get a feel, uh, uh, do, uh, uh, should I aim for about 20 minutes for the presentation or less? Or le 20 minutes will be great, CEO. Okay, thank you. I'll try and aim for that, Chairperson. Okay. Uh, uh, with that, uh, with your permission, uh, uh, let's uh, get into it. And uh, David, we shall go to the introduction screen, please. Uh, chairperson members, we are making introductory remarks here that uh, indeed the advent of COVID has impacted us all and as an organization, we are conducting an ongoing and continuous assessment of the impact of this uh, situation, both on the IDC itself, as well as to a large extent on the clients of the IDC. Uh, it is difficult to predict now, I'm sure all of us acknowledge that. However, we are monitoring the situations as they unfold. Uh, in the second instance, we are going to indicate to you members that uh, our response measures can be viewed in three parts. Uh, what we refer to as short-term immediate measures, and then in the second instance, more medium-term measures, and then uh, our efforts in terms of the long-term plans for uh, general economic recovery. Uh, we really uh, are seized with this task and indeed uh, uh, the economic recovery that we hope to get going as a country will require the efforts of all of us, not only the IDC, real estate in the obvious, uh, but also all stakeholders, government and uh, civil society. Uh, in terms of the immediate and urgent matters, uh, as we will demonstrate, we have adopted uh, transaction assessment and approval processes that are very much outside the ordinary 
uh, where we uh, have uh, our fast tracking assessment with a view to uh, get into decision outcomes uh, in uh, 10 working days or so from end to end. Uh, what we would like to also mention that indeed the IDC itself as an organization is being impacted by this uh, uh, phenomenon because a uh, chairperson, the IDC in terms of its financial position is really just an aggregation of the investments and the loans that we have given out there. So if uh, I make an example that we have an exposure in total in the order of around 7 billion or so to the tourism sector, if that sector comes under pressure like it is now, uh, those clients find it difficult to make their payments back to the IDC on their loans or service their equity commitments. Indeed, the IDC gets impacted that way. But as we will indicate, uh, I think we are fortunate in a sense that as an organization, uh, we are not in distress at all. And we have measures which we will explain to survive the transition through this uh, pandemic uh, period. Uh, next slide, uh, Chairperson. We do indeed exist in a global uh, context. What we want to say in this particular uh, slide, Chairperson, is that in as much as we completed our strategy planning process last year and uh, completed a corporate plan, which we submitted and got approved by the board and was indeed on its way to the uh, ministry, uh, we, when this pandemic came across, uh, we are now in the process of reviewing the strategic framework of the IDC, how we are going to do business in a global economy that is slowing down, in a South African economy which was already very much on the low side, and then of course the impacts on the specific sectors. Our specialists at the corporation look at the various sectors, be it manufacturing, mining sector, the agro sector, services such as tourism and the ICT, the energy sector and infrastructure, we evaluate those uh, at a detailed level and we are in the process of reformulating how we will support companies uh, going forward to enable them not only to survive this transition, but to recover over the medium to long term. In the next slide, Chairperson, Again, we are still painting an economic context really to the discussion, just pointing out here that the major economic regions of the world, which are the major trading regions with South Africa. Indeed, it is anticipated by economists that many of them during the current year will fall into very deep recessions. Uh, this, the relevance of this particular matter is exactly because the manufacturing businesses, the mining businesses and so on, in which the IDC is invested and is a financier, they trade into these economies. And when there are downturns in those economies, they have a, a, a corresponding downward effect uh, on the various sectors of uh, the South African economy and indeed our clients. The next slide, Chairperson, uh, it is just a macroeconomic outlook. Uh, the research department at the IDC continues uh, on an ongoing basis to perform this analysis. And in the middle of that screen, Chairperson, is our forecast, uh, our economics team's forecast regarding how we see the GDP performance of the economy panning out. Uh, uh, our forecast of a 6% uh, downturn, minus 6%, is indeed not very far off from the forecasts uh, of uh, other institutions uh, such as uh, Standard Bank, uh, indeed the uh, Central Bank as well, the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, of course, the driving factors uh, towards this low economic performance, the factors indicated on the right-hand side of this slide, Chairperson, the fact that household spending will come under pressure fixed investment will decrease sharply. Uh, unfortunately, government's own fiscal position uh, will be affected as we have seen 
um, the revenue authority reporting that government might be experiencing lesser collection rates and so on, as well as impacts on imports and so on, as well as uh, what we anticipate to be a moderate level of inflation. Again, this may be a little bit academic to a person, but it is important in the context of uh, sketching the picture within which we are operating, which then takes us now to the substance of the issues, i.e. the IDC's response uh, actions. Uh, next slide, Chairperson. We uh, indicate here to this honorable committee that our first uh, uh, action of response was to ensure the safety and the well-being of the staff members of the IDC. Uh, we, we, we took appropriate measures in terms of uh, providing the uh, technology equipment to enable uh, staff members of IDC to work from home. Uh, I'm talking to you from my home, but I do go to the office uh, periodically myself. We have been designated as an essential service. So we are available uh, the officials of the IDC are working from home, but we have a continuity in the operations of our organization. We have put in place various measures at the IDC, such as screening as people go in, uh, the sanitation uh, steps as uh, people go in. We are provided with gloves, we are provided with sanitizers to use to clean our computers and desks and so on. We have already made changes in the office environment in terms of creating distance between uh, officials. Fortunately, we run an open plan office system, so we are able to move chairs and desks apart. Uh, all these measures, Chairperson, and I will stop there, all of them aimed at uh, ensuring that our staff members who do go to work periodically indeed practice safety. And uh, we have just adopted yesterday a program of safety return to office as guided by the regulations that were promulgated. Uh, our staff members, particularly critical staff members, will return to the office in fewer numbers and progressively in the coming weeks and months, uh, depending on the guidance that we get from government, indeed many, more and more of us will go to the office. So we are managing that uh, in a safety conscious way. The next uh, uh, slide, Chairperson, uh, we would like to point out to committee that uh, we conducted a survey of our clients, uh, a so-called monkey survey, a quick dip stick survey. And indeed, uh, many of our clients are experiencing reductions in terms of their revenues, the exceptions being those who are in the agriculture as well as infrastructure and chemicals environment because the chemicals ones, many of them are supplying COVID requirements and then industrial infrastructure is mainly uh, companies in telecoms and uh, in the transportation sector, as well as uh, energy companies that are supplying independent power producers into ESCOM. Uh, and then, of course, agro processing companies. Those, indeed, are proving to be resilient in these uh, difficult times that we are in. But those who are in other sectors, uh, such as tourism, indeed are experiencing a downturn in their income performance and so on. Uh, but what we do have in place is that on a case-by-case -case basis, they approach us and we evaluate uh, the possibility to defer their payments where we can. Uh, we don't charge any additional interest, even if we defer payments to a later date. Uh, and by so doing, we are hoping we provide relief to our clients. The next slide, Chairperson, uh, a very important slide because it really summarizes what the point I made earlier on, i.e. our response is uh, three-pronged. In the immediate, 
it is an amount of 500 million, sorry, 800 million rand, which is made out of 300, which we received from DTIC, and 500, which we allocate from our own balance sheet to provide immediate relief measures for companies that provide uh, uh, equipment and other supplies that are required to combat uh, COVID. Then in the short term, as I've just indicated, liquidity support measures in the form of providing working capital and deferments and so on. And then in terms of the medium to long term, it is that 3 billion rand uh, allocation of money that we have set aside from our own uh, budget, from our own balance sheet. It is money from the IDC, which we are going to be deploying, and we have already started doing so, to businesses in order to support them, firstly through this transition, but in the second instance, hopefully build capacity for them to turn around and start improving over the next 12, 18 months going forward. So this is really the framework uh, 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 of our response. Uh, the next pages, Chairperson, contain the details really, uh, and uh, perhaps we shouldn't go into this detail. With regards to the, on the left-hand side, it is written there at the top, essential supplies intervention. This is uh, the one that relates to the 800 million rand. The details there regarding what the qualifying criteria are and how we uh, would process the application as well as the various uh, supplies that are relevant. And then on the right hand side is with regards to the, the 3 billion rand as well as specifying what the qualifying criteria are and the sectors that are covered. All this information, Chairperson, is available on the website of the IDC. So members of the public and the business sector uh, are well informed and can indeed very well informed. And as I indicated, the employees of the IDC are contactable. Every single staff member of the IDC is contactable by email, by phone, by mobile uh, uh, systems and so on in order to respond to uh, service uh, requests. Next chairperson, is just a, an example of companies that we have funded, uh, a company called Alsa, those uh, masks plus the chemicals, sanitizer, as well as another one called PharmaPack, which provides certain essentials that are used in the medical uh, area, as well as uh, Supra Health. This is just uh, uh, the three of the six companies that we have funded up to now. As at of the last count, we had approved about 379 million, as indicated there, Chairperson. Uh, I'm sure when we do our next tally by the end of this week, uh, that number will be uh, higher. This is in respect of those essential services supplies. And then, of course, in the next slide, Chairperson, I'm trying to move along a little bit faster, is uh, funding that we have uh, uh, advanced under the 3 billion rand uh, set aside program for transactions that we have done over the past uh, a month uh, amounting to just over half a billion. Uh, we have a pipeline of transactions and we see we will be accelerating that. In the next slide, Chairperson, just to mention that uh, as part of that 3 billion, uh, the executive committee of the IDC, of course, in consultation with the board, has also set aside as part of that 3 billion, uh, an amount of 300 million specifically for small industries. In other words, uh, companies with a turnover as defined in law, less than 50 million rand per annum, and whose uh, uh, financing needs would probably be on the lower end, say looking for 5 million or 10 million or maybe 15 million in the upper end. So. We already have about eight, 185 million rand or so worth of requests that we are reviewing in this regard. We do this mainly through our regional offices that are spread throughout the country in all the provinces. The next slide, Chairperson, this is more on the social investment side. The IDC made a contribution of 25 million to the Solidarity Fund 
In the second instance, we initiated an internal sort of in-house uh, solidarity fund of our own uh, as staff members where out of our salaries, we have opened up a bank account. We deposit money into that bank account and on an ongoing basis, our finance department aggregates it and passes it on to the National Solidarity Fund. We only started this one uh, beginning of last week, Chairperson, so it is just in the beginning. My appeal to the staff members is that we should sustain this at least over the next three months or so in order to help uh, those who are really poor out there and living in very difficult conditions. We donated 5 million rand to gift of the givers in order to do the kind of things that they are doing there on the screen, providing water uh, to communities in those rural areas. Chairperson. And interestingly, uh, one of our staff members came up with the idea of uh, developing an app. We are busy developing an app we should enhance uh, traceability uh, of, of COVID cases and so on. Uh, uh, indeed, we believe that we will continue to look at our CSI budget and see whether there's any additional allocations that we can provide to provide relief to the poor. So Chairperson, in summary, on the next slide, indeed in the medium term, as the lockdown begins to be lifted, uh, uh, opportunities arise for us to begin to support companies. Uh, we believe that uh, the master plans, industry master plans that I think the committee is familiar with might give us traction in certain instances. I'm thinking particularly about the one in the agricultural sector, in poultry and so on. Uh, some of our industries that are export oriented, the weaker rent for strange reasons, uh, is providing them with a greater competitiveness. Uh, and indeed, we want to do a little bit more, not just a little bit more, quite much more in the green industries uh, to support the policy program of government regarding renewable energy and so on. Uh, Chairperson, I'm moving towards the end. Uh, the next slide, a little bit of detail here, but what we are saying is that in terms of the revisions that we are making to our strategic framework, we see opportunities here as uh, localization and global value chains are getting readjusted. Sectors such as uh, meat production, food, uh, mining, uh, we believe that there might be a lot of opportunities for the textile sector and clothing, perhaps to start adjusting their production lines to produce uh, for the continent. We believe there's going to be an upsurge in the pharmaceuticals and medical uh, uh, area and so on to present telecommunications already is standing strong uh, and uh, we will continue to, to support these industries. These are the ones, Chairperson, where we see perhaps a faster recovery uh, uh, just by virtue of, uh, of uh, the demand supply patterns. Uh, Chairperson, in terms of concluding remarks, uh, the next, this one, this is my last slide, to say we are indeed uh, managing and mitigating risks as they come to us or as they present, Chair, sorry. Uh, uh, the first point to mention is that indeed the balance sheet of the IDC itself has to be managed and be managed carefully because, as I said, we may be receiving, we are already seeing downward trend in terms of receiving money from our repayments from the clients. In the second instance, Chairperson, we are concerned that maybe the transformation and empowerment uh, objectives of the IDC might be made even more difficult because many of the companies that we are already invested in that have BEE structures could be coming under financial pressure and financial stresses, which then places at risk those financial instruments that we have already put in place. So this pandemic is really bad. Uh, so indeed, there's pressure on our clients for business support, and we have to balance that uh, in terms of providing business support in order to ensure sustainability. The last point, and it is really a crucial one, is that uh, the various development finance institutions in the country, 
they constitute a development finance system, just like the banking system. We have a development finance system maybe made, made up of IDC, DBSA, Land Bank, and the other smaller ones, the NEF is part of that uh, complex, and then maybe the provincial ones. All we are saying here, Chairperson, is we are expected and we will be expected to play a bigger role in the economic recovery. However, uh, we have to note that we, we have pressures of our own in terms of our balance sheet strengths, and we are going to have to see the extent to which uh, the entire fiscal system and maybe working with the PIC and other entities, how we could uh, strengthen uh, the development finance system. Uh, the last slide really, Chairperson, is a concluding slide, just as messages of assurance to say, we remain open to business as much as we are waking away from home. Uh, in the second instance, uh, our own business partners, we are providing as much proactive support as we can. And indeed, we have activated support to communities through our CSI program. And uh, we have indicated to yourself, Chairperson and members, the three programs of action that we are pursuing in response uh, to COVID. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I appreciate your time. Uh, I took 25 minutes, I see. My apologies. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, CEO, uh, for the input. Can I then uh, ask members, th there will be questions for clarity. There may also be comments. Can I then invite the honorable members to uh, uh, speak to the report? Uh, Secretary, if you can help facilitate. Um, I'm chair? not sure who will be the members would like to come through. I will indicate to you, Chair, Mr. Yes. McPherson. Yes. Followed by Mr. Cutbirth. Yes. I'll, I'll put the rest later, Chair. McPherson. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> there's been a, a number of uh, statistics that have come out in the last uh, days and weeks that suggest we'll keep, that... We'll keep, sorry, McPherson. We will keep that three minutes uh, cycle uh, with the questions, uh, McPherson. Sure. Uh, that suggests that 50% uh, of businesses could fail uh, as they cannot afford to sustain themselves uh, for, 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 much, for much longer. We know that National Treasury have projected at the best case scenario, 3 million jobs will be lost. And the worst case scenario, set up to 70% unemployment may be experienced in South Africa. So I just want to understand on, against that background, uh, what disbursements uh, to date have been done by the IDC since the minister made the announcement um, of the distressed funding that would be available from the IDC? So disbursements to date and the applications that are still outstanding uh, and what is the age analysis of those uh, applications. And then my last question is uh, around uh, uh, triple B double E. Surely the IDC would agree that uh, that it's not only uh, businesses with BEE transactions that are at financial risk. Surely he would agree that all businesses are are uh, suffering financial risks. And it's really bad, to use his words, for everybody. It is not a, a black or white issue uh, for businesses that are experiencing financial hardship. So does the IDC still steadfastly believe that funding should only be based on one's BEE status? And if so... How does the IDC justify that, morally justify that, in a pandemic and financial crisis that all businesses face? Thank you. Covered. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm covered. Uh, Chairperson, Ms. Yaku. Yaku. Um, I think... 
try again, continue. Uh, ranking still. Okay. Um, still. Okay, I would like to thank the CEO for the presentation. Um, I think if ever there's a time we need to 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 build the capacity of the state, I think it would be now during this um, this COVID virus that that's that's affecting the country. Um, my worry is that um, with bigger companies who are able to carry the financial burden, um, they might be prioritized because it's safer to support them. So how much of the portion is given to your emerging smaller businesses? Um, I would like. I think it's in line with what Honourable um, McPherson alluded to. Um, and 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 how long does the evaluation process take in terms of the relief funding? Um, another question I would like to ask: How well does um, the IDC work uh, with the SABS and and the other regulations uh, in terms of um, making sure that the services that are provided and given to our people are of good quality and standard um, because of, because of the demand at the moment? And um, I'm glad that he mentioned uh, his social responsibility, um, the CSI, um, the 5 million that has been given to the gift of the givers. Um, also, I'd like to know how much is being prioritized to um, spaces where there isn't that much industry and there isn't that much access to job opportunities, such as your rural spaces um, and your provinces, especially that are lacking um, in terms of acquiring um, you know, access to 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 essentials such as food. Um, so, are they only giving to the gift of the givers, or are they extending to other NGOs or whoever is able to 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 assist in terms of giving to the community? Thank you. Okay. The next one, Andre. Uh, you okay, sorry, Mr. Thring. <laughs> oh, Honorable Thring. Honorable uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I want to um, thank the CEO for the presentation. Um, slide five uh, of the IDC presentation shows that household spending is set to plummet. Fi fixed investment activity is expected to uh, fall sharply. Fiscal met metrics to worsen, worsen substantially. Exports set to drop considerably. Uh, imports set to decline substantially, substantial job losses, unemployment to increase to some 36.5% by the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, the RAND is under pressure and South Africa economy uh, to fall into a deep recession in 2020, where GDP growth is expected to be at minus 6.3%. So in the light of those particular economic indicators, um, the first question to the CEO is, is the 36.5% unemployment increase uh, predicted by the IDC, is that a percentage of unemployment increase on the narrow or on the broad definition of unemployment? I think as Honorable McPherson indicated, uh, economic indicators or economists are predicting in excess of 50% um, unemployment, particularly on the, uh, uh, the broad definition of unemployment. And then secondly, um, with these worsening <coughs> economic indicators, uh, does the IDC have an opinion um, or a recommendation as to when the restrictions on the economy uh, ought to be removed uh, so that businesses can continue to do business? Because the longer the lockdown stays in place, uh, the more businesses we are finding uh, having to be rescued and going into distress. And then my third question kind of ties in with uh, Honorable Yako, um, where we've, in, we've seen a uh, 5 million donation to the gift of the givers. Uh, we also know that there are many other NGOs uh, that are doing sterling work um, and may not necessarily raise their hands up, uh, but spend hundreds of thousands of rands of their own finances and are now beginning to run short. Um, how do those particular NGOs and relig other religious organizations uh, access funding from the IDC? Thank you. Can I take the next one, Andre? Chair, Mr. Mbuyani. Mbuyani. Honorable Mbuyani. Honorable Mbuyani. He needs to unmute. Can you unmute? Yes, Chair. 
Okay, I'm muted. Yeah. Yours, Mr. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Let me welcome the opportunity and also welcome the presentation. Chairperson, maybe I will start with the, the 800 million that will be reprioritized to the IDC for SME support. And I just wanted to check how will this impact the budget of the department. And the uh, chairperson, the other one in, in terms of the member staff, uh, the action response, uh, as you said. Uh, the, the other one, chair, the reviewing of a strategic framework, how, how is it going to impact? To the job losses and also the impact that has been already been there by the COVID uh, the pandemic. And also I want to understand the formulation uh, who's going to be funded in terms of the reopening of the, uh, the economy. How is it going to be, to be done? Share the action response there maybe in one, two, which is to create sanitizer gloves and stuff. So I just wanted to check in terms of the staff because I hear that the staff has already uh, tried to create a uh, uh, distance in the office and also they are, they are, they are working in dealing with the office. Uh, the, last part was, um, the last part was a bit blurry. Um, uh, uh, Muyan, the, la the question again. The one you just done. Yes. Okay, no, I can repeat. Yeah. Uh, I was talking in terms of the, the, the screening, uh, the sanitizers, and the uh, PPE, uh, PPE that is provided to to the staff members. Okay. So yes, and also they are creating the, the distance, as they said, in the terms of the staff members. Then also, chair. We, there's one issue here of 379 million approved to assist essential services. Okay, continue. You're, 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 I'm not you're, so sure whether it's just apply or the one that I'm, I'm fine now. Can I continue, yeah. Chair? Yeah, you actually went away a bit here. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Just repeat that. Yeah, one and again. I'll, I'll, I'll repeat again and again, Chair. No, the point is that and you go away. We can't hear you completely. The, the last one yeah. you just did. Yes, I'm not sure what's happening, but your line is not good. Oh, okay. okay. No, no I'm saying we, 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 we welcome the in house ITC COVID 19 solidarity fund. Yes. Uh, for staff for staff members. Okay. And they say also yeah, that one we are welcoming and also we are applauding yes. the department, maybe the entity. Yeah, yes. and also Jefferson, the intervention here in terms of the restructuring of global value chain and the localization. Yeah. Yes, then I wanted to check vis a vis the in-house and the intervention in terms of the value chain. Uh, how how does local uh, localization mean able to be managed? The last one, chair, is in terms of the managing and the mitigation. Uh, in terms of the transformation objective, how are they managing to deal with that process? Because currently, all businesses, as the the, the, the latter speaker has indicated, all businesses are in distress. No matter whether it's BEE you know, or, or the, the private sector, but all businesses need assistance here. So I just want to check whether, in terms of the financial return and the risk, how are they going to manage it? Mm -hmm. uh, Chairperson, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Mbuyane. The next one. Chairperson, Mrs. Hermans. Hermans. Honorable Thank you, Chair. My my sound is back. Um, I have been I have been largely covered by Honorable Mbuyani, but.
But let me just join him in commending the IDC for the good work done during this very difficult time. And also the innovation that's taking place at IDC is very encouraging in terms of the app and even thinking outside the box in uh, how they are tackling the, the challenges that they are faced with. Um, I also just wanted to, but I think Honorable Mbuyani did mention it to check whether there are any, um, how, how, how the job security situation is at IDC, given that, um, that uh, you know, that things are going to get tougher as we go along. And then I also just want to check with the IDC uh, if they are saying they are managing with their own money at the moment, their own balance sheet. What, what is their projection? Uh, maybe I missed it in the presentation for how long will they be able to carry themselves uh, uh, with their own funds and, uh, because eventually uh, their funds will run out and even they will have to go into business rescue. So if we can just have an indication, Chair. Okay, thank you. The next one is any, yes. Chair, sir. Ms. Mantashe. Honorable Mantashe. Mantashe. Thank you, Chairperson. Chair, uh, we appreciate the strides by IDC in intervening during this difficult time in the life of the country. Uh, I just want to check if they can uh, uh, at least put me in, in, in the green light. The loan repayment holiday from April to June 2020 of, of debt with their clients, will there be a possibility informed by analysis of the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown to extend the payment holiday period for their clients. Again, Chair, I want to check um, uh, how I wish that the, the merger with of them and, I, and NEF, they could fight for and so that it can be sped up because I think their muscle could be strengthened so that they can be an, of assistance to many businesses that will go under, to, to, that will be distressed this time around. I also wish that they could really support, especially those businesses that are under stress and the small businesses in particular, because they are the backbone of our economy. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Honorable Matash. The next, Chair, you have the next member, yes. There's no more questions, Chair. We can get the response from the IDC. Okay. Can, can I just say, the um, um, CEO, th there's a small point which I wanted just to comment on, because you know, on, on issues that relate to services, particular water, it might actually be something very important to understand the area where the community will be getting support from the IDC, check if ever the municipality have had any plans to be able to provide that basic service like water, we might find that there might be support we can give to facilitate, to be able to use this intervention to something that is more sustainable. I'm just looking at the water point when actually you have a tanker, but you might find there's a reasonable project where the municipality is not able to complete and uh, be able to have that service sustainably. Because obviously, in the nature of intervention we have, we see that they are a bit short term. And they do actually make impact for that period, but they will go away, obviously. So I thought maybe I should ask that or just give that comment, because I think it's quite strategic to in have the intervention where there's an opportunity for sustainable supply work with the local municipality to be able to advise, guide for a more sustainable service in the area. Thank you very much. Can I take, uh, give it back to you, uh, CEO, and your team? Chairperson, uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, my sincere appreciation to members of the committee for their 
questions of clarification. Um, uh, we will respond to the best uh, of our abilities. And uh, my colleague, uh, David Jarvis. Uh, David, please uh, get yourself ready as well to uh, assist me uh, where perhaps I, I have gaps. Um, the first question was on the context of a really declining economy and uh, a request for information regarding uh, how much uh, the IDC has disbursed. Uh, uh, just supplement with me, uh, uh, David, but what I do have in, on my records is that in total, uh, uh, over the past uh, uh, month or so, we have disbursed as an organization in total on various uh, initiatives, uh, 733 million rand. Uh, in particular, we indicate on slide, I don't know, the, I think it's slide 11, that 379 million has been approved for emergency COVID funding, but not all of it has been disbursed now. About only 130, 130 million of it has been paid out. Uh, I, members will appreciate that we approve a transaction today, then we have to do the admin work of signing the agreements and getting the FICA clearances and you know going through the admin stuff. But many of the facilities, in fact, all of the facilities that we are providing under the emergency COVID uh, program, the 800 million rand, of which we have approved as of last week's 379, many of them are three months uh, facilities. So they will be drawn down within four weeks. This, that's how the scheme is structured. They will be drawn down within four weeks of uh, uh, of. Uh, of uh, approval. In terms of the, 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 the applications that are still outstanding, uh, I just want to check my numbers. We, we have a, in aggregate under this scheme, under this emergency scheme, uh, 160 million, 160 million of applications that are in assessment, they are being evaluated. Uh, the, the, here is an interesting statistic, uh, members. You know, uh, unfortunately, at times when, when uh, programs like this are opened up, some people do apply, uh, some of the applications are not relevant and they don't meet the qualifications of, uh, of the scheme and so on. So we did receive a long, substantial list of, uh, I think, running in, in excess of the... Uh, a billion really, uh, somewhere in the order of about 275 inquiries, uh, which we, we have to process, sift through, and then uh, to, 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 to approve and to pay out, as I've indicated. I would like to address the issue of uh, 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 Black economic empowerment, or, or so, and, I, and, and I'll try and address it as best as I can. Uh, to say that in terms of the IDC Act, the IDC has a, a, a generic mandate of advancing industrial development in the country, but it also has a transformation mandate of seeking to uh, promote greater inclusion and participation uh, in the economy in line with the uh, Black Economic Empowerment Policies. In our work on a day-to-day -day basis, we do not discriminate on the basis of someone doesn't have the credentials or they don't have. We actively go out and try and promote transformation transactions and try and bank those. However, we do support all industrial enterprises in this country. So for the record uh, to the member, Really, the words the chairperson such as the IDC is steadfastly believing, that is not correct. We don't hold a steadfast belief that we, we choose uh, uh, those that we support on the basis of black and white. 
we have a mandate for industrial development and equally we have a mandate to drive transformation. So we do give uh, attention to all citizens of the Republic of South Africa uh, to receive support. But we do push for, for transformation because we are mandated to do so. Uh, the next set of questions, uh, Chairperson, uh, our support to small business, uh, I indicated, I think it's slide number 13, that for this uh, period that we are in, we are setting aside specifically 300 million rand to be distributed uh, through the loan program, through our regional offices that are located in all the provinces of the country. And this is a concessionary facility where we price it at prime minus 3%. It is specifically for small business sector loans, you know, loans as small as a million, maybe two, three, four, and we have set ourselves an upper limit cap of 15, one, five million rand to support uh, the small business program. Uh, how long does the process uh, take for the for the emergency transactions for COVID, we have set ourselves a standard of 10 working days. And we have been pressing hard on the professional teams to meet those standards. We as the decision makers, the management team, meet twice a week to give approvals to these uh, submissions as they come through. Uh, but indeed, the standard uh, way of uh, doing things at the IDC is that we have to conduct due diligence and so on. So that particular standard of 10 working days I'm referring to is specifically for this under abnormal emergency circumstances that we are, we are in at the moment. On, on the CSI, I, I do take the point that has been made to say, what about those uh, uh, other NGOs or entities uh, uh, that are in far-flung places and so on and so on. Uh, just to say, members, the reason why we partnered with the Gift of the Givers was because we thought that, and we, do, we are convinced that they have this uh, extensive reach throughout the country. However, we can take that as a, a point uh, to, for us to work through. Indeed, uh, I can just mention, for instance, that we are also gearing up to support the, 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 the schools. There are about uh, 20 or so schools that we have adopted throughout the country, high schools, uh, that we will be supporting as they return back to the curriculum. So uh, the challenge, as I hear it from you, honorable members, is whether we can not extend the envelope of the IDC yeah. Uh, uh, much more than uh, we have uh, done up to now. Uh, my, my colleague, uh, David, might want to add a little bit on that. David, do you want to add? Uh, yes, yeah, thank uh, you, CEO. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe just to add that we yeah. are also providing an open window for support to uh, additional NGOs um, and and uh, have already, for example, approved uh, funding for uh, an NGO called Kids Haven, which was to provide food parcels to impoverished children, children who are out of school and who rely on uh, the, the lunch that they receive at school as a main meal of the day. So we are pursuing those types of opportunity in terms of our social investment, and that's ongoing. Mm -hmm. So that window of opportunity is there, and indeed we can provide ongoing updates uh, to the committee chairperson if we are required to do so. Uh, the question about where the, our, uh, the definition regarding to unemployment, indeed it is a, a narrow definition because uh, our economists uh, uh, have adopted that particular uh, style of analysis. Um, and that indeed I think all of us... Uh, uh, unfortunately, so are fearful that the unemployment rates are going to increase very dramatically. That is why, indeed, uh, the point that was made, uh, I think, by Member Yako is so critical about 
strengthening the uh, the state system, including uh, 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 development finance institutions. What is our view, or do we have a recommendation regarding uh, the opening of uh, of the lockdown uh, of the economy and so on? Uh, Unavoidably, we do think about this all the time. We think about it all the time as the IDC. Uh, it is a delicate one because it is about uh, balancing risk to life, uh, but also the uh, economy on the one hand. So how we have uh, approached it up to now, Chairperson, I am participating in sector forums. So. I participate with uh, the mining sector CEOs or, and uh, tourism sector CEOs and those in the clothing and textiles. And the nature of our conversation is that we say, what kind of measures of safety can you come up with as a sector in order to give government and the leadership in the uh, national command that when you do open your specific sector, you will exercise adequate safety arrangements such that people's lives are not endangered. So we are actively working. Our interest is to see as much of the economy as open as possible because we are exposed as an organization to all sectors of the economy, but we are working through the sectors. In fact, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the level four, we estimate that probably just over 55% of the sectors that the IDC works in have been partially opened somehow. So that is why I think uh, it is better to, to take a sector approach towards that question. Uh, the question about NGOs, I think, has been responded to Chairperson and uh, uh, David uh, uh, added there, my colleague. Uh, the question, Member Mbuyani, about how will uh, the, the funding impact the budget? Uh, just to be clear, of that 800 million rand, uh, 300 million was already transferred from the Department of Trade and Industry and Competitions to the IDC. So it is the one that we are utilizing. They got treasury uh, top-up allocation for it on the M MCEP program. Then the 500 million rand is cash that is available at the IDC. Uh, the review of our strategic framework, all that we are saying there, Chairperson, is that as the economy reopens, we are redefining for ourselves how are we going to target our funding? Which sectors are we going to move fast in order to support, in order to drive faster economic recovery? Uh, while at the same time balancing that with the financial resources of the IDC. So uh, a specific question about who is going to be funded. I think slide number 16, the one that talks about industrial opportunities, uh, we specify those sectors. And it is those sectors that I said, we think they might see a faster recovery than other sectors. But indeed, I think it is important to mention that they are not at the exclusion of uh, the other uh, sectors. Yes, uh, we are very comfortable about the protection measures that we have taken to protect the staff. Uh, thank you very much. Localization, uh, Chairperson, and, uh, will indeed be uh, largely driven on the back of these priority sectors that we have identified on this slide here. The question of transformation, yes, indeed, is very tricky, as I indicated, in a sense that we, are not, we don't want to stop the momentum on transformation. Chairperson, your mic is not on. Uh, the CEO has frozen. Yeah. Yeah. If you can just say, let's check if... Uh, uh, Nish, uh, I will ask the IT guy to assist, Chair. Yeah, David Jarvis, if ever he's around. 
Okay. Chair, I think I'm not sure if the IT guy is present on the platform now, Chair. Okay. So what? What can we just check, da Jarvis? Mr. Davis Jarvis, uh, because he was actually uh, presenting jointly with the CEO, yeah. Jarvis. Maybe he's there. Yes, yes, Chair. Yes. We'll check the, 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 the technical with this. So if you can just proceed on the other mm. issues, say, pick up. So, so Chair, there was, I think the, the CEO was almost finished. Sure. Um, yes. There was a couple of issues which uh, we, we still hadn't addressed. Um, the one, Chair, was around job security. Uh, at RDC. Currently, um, uh, we don't see any impact from the COVID crisis in terms of, in terms of job security um, at RDC. Um, we are obviously managing, uh, we, we do have a focus on our cash management, uh, and we are quite confident uh, that we do have sufficient cash to operate. Um, but as the CEO did point out uh, in the presentation, uh, one of the opportunities which we are looking for is to partner with uh, either government or private sector in terms of additional fi funding sources which we can deploy in support of our efforts uh, for COVID-19. Uh, and I think he did make that point that um, yeah. like any organization, you'll see that a, a, a lot of advice has been coming from uh, uh, consulting houses around how companies need to, in this uncertain time, manage very tightly their cash management. So we do have a focus on that, but we are not cash constrained and we do have funding to support the efforts that we've highlighted. Um, obviously we do realize that the challenge which COVID-19 has, has, has placed in front of us requires crowding in of additional funds. Uh, and we are working with the department uh, and other stakeholders to, to, uh, to, to, to do exactly that. Um, I think in terms of the small business, we did mention uh, we, we, we did mention that we have put funding aside. It's, it's small industrial finance, 300 million, which we have put aside to support uh, uh, this, uh, those companies which are within sectors that we normally support, um, uh, which we will be which we will be rolling out over the next couple of months. Um, uh, in terms of the debt relief, we are engaging our clients on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so as, as the CEO highlighted, there are those who, who actually are looking for working capital in this environment because they've actually got up opportunities, whether it's supplying PPE um, within the agro and, and food space, et cetera. Um, so, so we are looking at those opportunities, but also on a case-by-case -case basis, we'll we, we are looking at the at at, at those companies which are, are in distress. Um, uh, Chair, then just on your on your comment, uh, it's a, a very useful comment, and I think we're going to take it uh, and 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 see how we can incorporate working with local municipalities. It's a, a very useful comment. Thank thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm hoping that's all the questions covered. Okay, Chair, I think um, the CEO is back. Uh, CEO. Uh, I'm sorry for that. Uh, technology is working harder than us. <laughs> if I can help yeah. you back, try and round up, and then we actually uh, uh, conclude. And, uh, uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Sorry for that glitch. Uh, I hear that uh, David did cover uh, the last points. Uh, just to yes. re-emphasize that uh, at the IDC, indeed, we, we, we don't foresee any problems regarding maybe having to look at staff reductions or anything, not, not at all. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I see my colleague, the CFO, Nongkulile Kodlamini is also on the line. She is running a very tight ship in terms of managing the cash flow of the organization on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis. In fact, Chairperson, what we have done is we have set a, 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 a task team which is made up of three board members as well as members of the management team. We meet on a weekly basis to review cash as well as the payouts that are required. So we are very comfortable in terms of the, the plan that we have in front of us, that we have enough cash and we will continue to, to manage our affairs properly. Then other than that, I really appreciate the advice that was given uh, by various members of this committee, Chairperson.
Okay. Um, um, I, th I think those, those were the comments. Thank you very much, CEO and the team. Uh, maybe if the members do agree, can I ask that we then yeah. take the next presentation? Yeah. Unless they are actually very yeah. urgent questions. I, I hear someone coming through. Ms. Mantashe, Chair. Okay. Uh, Mantashe? Chair, I, I, I wrote on, on the chat, but I think I must also talk on it. I just wanted to check with the CEO if she has the, the, the names of the school and the provinces they are situated of those schools that they say they will be supporting, that they have uh, adopted or sort of. Oh, okay, okay, okay. yes. Uh, uh, can I take a secretary before you conclude, CEO? Chair, because I don't think there is there any other member who was raised. No that? other member, Chair, but just to say yeah. that we have noted the question and, 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 and we will follow up that after the meeting as well. But Mr. Thring said there is, his question was not responded to on funding for other NGOs. Okay, funding for the other NGOs and I think maybe the issue of the adopted schools. Um, uh, let, let's take a comment then, the concluding comment, CEO. And I think, Secretariat, we can follow through for information yes. like the one of the adopted school. I'm sure yes. we can try and then access that detail. Thank yeah. you, Anor Montasha and Thring. Uh, CEO, if you can round up. Thank you, Chairperson. Quickly, uh, we will provide a list of those schools uh, immediately, uh, as early as tomorrow, through the committee secretariat, uh, where they are located and so on and so on. It's a very good program that we've been running for a couple of years now. Uh, with regards to the, uh, the NGOs, what we said, Chairperson, were three things. One, that uh, we, we chose the... Uh, gift of the givers because of their depth of reach in various places. But uh, my colleague David indicated that we have opened a window of applications. So the various NGOs can indeed go to our website today and check and apply for any uh, 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 corporate social responsibility uh, uh, support. So we have opened the window. And in the third instance, Chairperson, I said I'm taking it away as a point uh, to say we are being challenged here to see how far our CSI RAND can be stretched, particularly in order to reach uh, far-flung remote areas in deep rural areas and so on. Uh, thank you, Chair. Wonderful. Okay, can we then take the next presentation? And thank you very much, COO and your team. And thank then, you, sir. Okay, most appreciated. Can we take the next presentation of the NEF uh, Secretariat? If we can actually be able to um, uh, put up the presentation. And can Chair, I actually please. welcome Umamupilisiwem uh, yeah. uh, CEO and the team uh, for the NEF presentation. The, the, it is up, I can see. It. Can I welcome up, the CEO? Yeah. CEO, floor is yours. Good, 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 good afternoon, uh, Honorable Chairperson and members of Joint Committee on Trade and Industry. Joining us this afternoon, Chairperson, I'm happy to reintroduce the 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 Chairman of the of the NEF, Mr. Rakesh um, uh, Garish, um, who is also um, the CFO of another um, you know, financial institution. So it, it always helps to actually get that guidance and actually compare the work of the NEF with the work that they are doing um, at the bank. Mr. Mzi Daimani, who's the NEF's general counsel, uh, responsible for our post-investment uh, division uh, that provides mentorship support, the turnaround workouts and restructuring units as well as our socioeconomic development unit, which is the unit that is responsible for all the work that we are doing in rural communities. I'm also uh, joined by Ms. Klingwe Makatini, who's the executive, uh, divisional executive for our venture capital and corporate um, finance um, division. 
uh, whose purview encompasses support for medium-sized companies and black industrialists. Um, and then lastly, uh, we are accompanied by Mr. Lebohang Seritsi, who is our CFO. Uh, and then my name, Chairperson, is the Kilisiwe um, Tetra, the CEO of the National Empowerment Fund. So thank you, Chairperson and honorable members for this opportunity to share the highlights of the work the NEF is continuing to do in, in implementing measures to help our countries fight against the coronavirus, but also in helping our country with its uh, transformation imperative. And I'm very um, happy to say, um, Chairperson and honorable members, that we are very proud uh, to be the only DFI um, uh, in the country that has been given uh, the opportunity to actually drive the implementation uh, of uh, BEE without any uh, fear or, or, or faith. So the work that we have done in response to the COVID-19 pandemic is in line with the NEF, with the mandate of the NEF, which is to grow black economic uh, empowerment and we do this chairperson by providing financial and non-financial support. So even as we will be talking about the work that we're doing uh, within the COVID-19 space, we are still pursuing our agenda of transforming uh, the South African economy. As the joint committee is aware, today the NEF has approved funding in excess of 10 billion for black entrepreneurs across all sectors of the economy including healthcare, manufacturing, and agro-processing. And um, I think it's uh, important for the committee to note that the NEF, even though we are dealing with black companies only and uh, SMMEs, we are actually a DFI. I don't think we should fall in the other category. Uh, I think we are a serious DFI that is doing um, a lot of good work for our black companies in the country. Next slide. So as the joint committee is aware, unencumbered cash um, is the uncommitted cash available and is de determined by considering bank balances uh, less approvals. So it's all the cash um, that we have in the bank, but we then out of the cash, for instance, we currently have 1.3 billion um, um, uh, rands at the moment, which is our cash balance. But from that amount, we'll actually look how much of that amount is already committed and how much is uncommitted. So if you look at the un unencumbered portion, we're actually sitting at 200 million. And then if you look at the total cash balance that we have um, in the bank, we are still sitting with 1.3 uh, 1 billion as we, as we currently speak, uh, Chairperson. Slide seven, when the lockdown began, uh, honorable members, the NEF immediately implemented its uh, business continuity plan. Accordingly, employees uh, of the NEF have been working from home, ensuring the NEF remains open for business. It is for, for this reason, Chairperson, that in partnership with the DTIC on 26 March 2020, the NEF announced the establishment of a 200 million COVID 19 BEE fund that has been set up exclusively to support black owned enterprises in South Africa. Next slide, what this slide, uh, slide eight um, outlines are the three key pillars, pillars of the NEF's contribution to government's COVID-19 response. And these are firstly, the 200 million uh, endowment from the DTIC for NEF COVID-19 Black Business Fund to support the manufacture of essential healthcare, healthcare pro products and the production of priority food items that are in short supply. Secondly, following a extensive and continuous portfolio monitoring and risk assessment, the NEF has also granted loan and interest repayment holidays to 47% of businesses in our invested portfolio in a relief relief package that is valued at 50 million. The NEF, which is the third leg, intervention is also through partnerships for com community solidarity, which has resulted in the distribution of food parcels 
to more than 4,800 households that have been affected by the pandemic. So Chairperson, uh, when it comes to this leg, we just thought as the employees of the NEF that we also needed to take the pain and feel the pain. So we decided in addition to everything else that our government is doing for our country, what else can we sacrifice directly now from our own pockets? And then I'm very um, pleased to inform the committee that from our own pockets, the NEF has contributed about 1.5 million um, in terms of the distribution of parcels to all the impoverished um, areas of the country. And we're very lucky that with the 1.4 million that was from our own pockets, we've been able to leverage an additional 2 million rents from Bidvest. Um, in fact, it was through Bidfood, which is the subsidiary of Bidvest, of Bidvest. So over the last weekend and last week, we've been in all the you know impoverished areas of the country, in the rural areas, um, delivering food parcels to those needy uh, communities. Slide nine, um, as stated, um, Chairperson, we're also grateful to the DCIC for the 200 million grant for the NEF for the establishment of the COVID-19 BEE fund. So fortunately, our shareholder did not say the NEF is in the other category. He actually thought in the DTIC that the NEF has a role to play um, in this um, you know, environment as well. So this has enabled black entrepreneurs to sec secure funding of between uh, 500,000 and 10 million rent in concessionary loans. This is for the entrepreneurs to be able to purchase machinery, equipment, and raw materials, and to fund other working capital requirements for the manufacture and supply of healthcare products and the production of essential foods. For this purpose, uh, Chairperson and Honorable Members, the NEF reviewed uh, its systems and procedures to be able to process, to process COVID-19 funding applications speedily while ensuring that risks are, are, are optimally identified and mitigated. As the committee will agree, extraordinary circumstances require innovation. This slide, which is slide 11, shows how NEF has set itself the target of disbursing the funds within a two-week window a period of approval. Specifically, we have had to shorten our turnaround time for screening, due diligence, approval, and drafting loan agreements for disbursements. This has required that investment associates at NEF work around the clock, including weekends, to meet the high volume of applications and navigate the exigencies of the operating environment. So I'm pleased, Chairperson and Honorable Members, to report that this operational flexibility has enabled us to shorten turnaround times significantly. Slide 12, the healthcare products supported are varied. Uh, the next slide, and they include the following. Uh, we have supported, uh, can you move to the next slide? They have supported the, the, the following products, which is hand sanitizers, is the gloves, is the masks, is the coronavirus te test kits, is the personal protective clothing, hospital linen and clothing, mattresses and sponges, and the list goes on, uh, Chairperson. Slide 13 is agreed with the DTIC in terms of the salient features of the NEF uh, DTIC COVID-19 BEE fund. Funding is limited to 10 million per applicant for working capital, machinery, and equipment. The first drawdown must occur within one month from approval date to ensure speedy access to capital and to accelerate Black business response to the pandemic. So we didn't want, uh, or our shareholder didn't want to see our Black uh, enterprises, you know, just sitting and, uh, you know, sitting at home and, you know, being spectators when there's this huge need for the products that I have already um, alluded to. To alleviate the cost of capital, investors are offered a payment moratorium of up to 12 months at a 0% fixed in interest rate. It will only be after 12 months that a fixed interest rate of 2.5% will apply, which constitutes a patriotic concession for our investors 
is to actually try and, re and reduce the cost of borrowing. The funds offers a maximum repayment term of 60 months, inclusive of the moratorium period that has been granted. To qualify slide 14 for COVID-19 BEE funding, investees, um, this is like for your bedtime a, a reading. I don't think it's necessary, but in case you have questions on our qualification criteria, it's, it's similar to our qualifi qualification a criteria for our uh, other products. But when you go to slide 15, further in terms of the criteria and in line with the mandate of the NEF, applicants must have greater than 50% black shareholding and management control. So we're looking at supporting black companies that are directly involved in the day-to-day -day running of the operation and must have requisite expertise in the sector and they must demonstrate the inv their involvement in the, in the sector before actually approach approaching the NEF for this BEE uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, funding. So the business must have a, pro a project with a minimum requirement of 500,000 in working capital machinery and equipment. If it's lower than that, it actually goes to another DFI um, that is actually called CIFA. So that's what CIFA has been um, dealing with. And lastly, applicants must submit all their relevant documents. Slide 16, I don't have to go through the list of documents because it's very similar to the work that we've been doing in, other, in all the other funds of the NEF. Slide 17, the NEF COVID-19 Fund Investment Committee meets on a weekly basis to consider applications the NEF has assigned teams comprising the CEO, um, senior officials from the DTIC, NEF executives, uh, board members, fund man managers, and the list goes on. I don't have to go through each and every member who sits um, on that particular um, committee, safe to say that um, as part of the DTIC's oversight responsibility, they have also ensured that they are senior, um, you know, DTIC officials who also serve on the same committee. So, Chairperson, as the committee will be uh, aware, the demand will always outstrip available resources. At the time when we prepared this presentation for the, for the committee, the NEF had received 172 applications. To date, the NEF has received through the COVID fund 250 applications valued at more than 725 million rands for equipment and working capital, respectively, as public awareness and demand gains momentum. So essentially what we're saying, Chairperson, is that we want to position these companies for also for future growth. So we're not just looking at the immediate needs that have arisen as a result of the COVID-19 in a pandemic. We're also looking at how is it going to be possible for the same companies maybe one day to end up supplying, you know, some of the countries within the SEDEC uh, region, because I think goods can still be moved, you know, from one SEDEC country to the next. So when we look at them, we, uh, we actually, uh, we, take, we always take a long-term view in terms of assessing the transactions. I'm pleased, Chairperson, to report that to date, the fund has approved 12, uh, 12 transactions worth over 78 million. And I'll, I'd like to remind the committee that we started working on this fund about like putting together the criteria and all the other requirements about five weeks ago. Approvals and disbursements projected to escalate progressively. Uh, we're looking at the, at the investment pack for this coming Friday. It looks like we'll be approving an additional um, 25 million rands worth of transactions. So on slide 18, we have listed all the transactions that have been approved. The individual profiles follow in the subsequent sections of this uh, presentation. And allow me to state, Honorable Chairperson, that we believe that 12 approved transactions over the past four weeks is a spirited beginning for the National Empowerment Fund. So even if we are small, 
if even if we are a small DFI, we believe that you can still have a big role to play uh, in the South African economy. Are there any of our moments of deepest uh, displeasure are when we have to decline an application for funding? Regrettably, Chairperson, over the past three weeks, transactions valued at approximately 400 million have been declined. The reasons range from applications not meeting the criteria for the fund, for example, applications for construction or tourism related businesses. In some instances, applicants did not have existing businesses, so they're just uh, taking chances. Um, in Zulu, I, I can only say it in Zulu, so they just saw the adverts and they started, um, you know, um, approaching the NEF. But because we've been in this space for many, many years, we're actually able to, to, to see through um, some of their shenanigans. But obviously, chairperson in this space, um, you can't take away the the, the possibility of uh, some of the of the companies white owned businesses that we're now trying to front with um, you know with our black um, enterprises but we've also been able to identify uh, the fronters both the fronters and the frontiers. I'm certain that honourable members will agree that a prudent funder entrusted with the management of public funds has to ensure that the scarce resources have to be used optimally for their intended purpose. So as we grow the numbers in the coming week, the principle will continue to reign supreme as we seek to support eligible black entrepreneurs to help South Africa confront the challenges of the COVID-19 crisis. And then the next slide is showing the geographical spread, uh, Chairperson. At this stage, the 12 approved transactions are domiciled in Houting, the Western Cape, and Guazulu Natal, while the vast majority of applications have been from these three provinces. Our regional offices are hard at work soliciting and actively sourcing COVID-19 related transactions to broaden the geographic spread for the portfolio. Slide 20, Honorable Chairperson, as we enter the second to last section of, of our presentation, allow me to Posit our investees within a wider global and national economic milieu. As the coronavirus pandemic continues to grow, both globally across South Africa, all projections are that our country must brace itself for tough times. And obviously, that should also include uh, our investee companies. I won't go through all the macroeconomic analysis because our colleagues uh, from the IDC have already, um, you know, uh, eloquently uh, touched on these uh, areas. So I'll go to slide 22, which talks, which talks to the NEF portfolio monitoring and risk analysis. I won't go through the economic in overview. So our continuous portfolio monitoring and risk anal analysis chairperson shows that economic overview we have just outlined poses ominous threats for black entrepreneurs who are already battling against an, an array of severe market failures. The NEF's uh, top active exposure amounts to 1.4 billion across key sectors of the economy, and these include property, energy, media, tourism, and entertainment, transportation, manufacturing, and retail. And as a result of the lockdown, only 25% of these are currently operational. And these are largely in the property, retail, essential players in the manufacturing and in the healthcare sector, including our hospitals. 16% of the investors are operating at reduced capacity. And these are largely in the energy and media sector. So, Chairperson, you'll remember that the NEF has invested um, close to 400, uh, close to 500 million um, in the property sector and uh, in our, in the petroleum, um, you know, uh, sector of the economy. So even though the petroleum sector is still operational, they are operating at very, very reduced, um, you know, uh, rates or levels. The vast majority at 59% are presently non-operational, and these include the tourism sector, 
where the NEF has invested in hotels, BNBs in the townships and rural areas, and in the lodges. Also non-operational are most of the investments in manufacturing, entertainment, hospitality, transportation, construction and materials, as well as services. So because the bulk of the NEF's investees are under lockdown, only 7% have adequate cash reserves to meet their loan obligations, while 65% require temporal cash relief. 28% were already under a moratorium before the lockdown for a variety of reasons. And this includes business premises were still under uh, construction, commissioning of the plant and equipment. So it's just the same criteria we have followed when we have actually granted those moratoriums. Slide 23. So for, the, for those investors that struggle to meet NEF loan repayments, the NEF has had to provide moratoriums to save both the business and jobs. For those that face the challenge of paying salaries and critical costs, two month soft loans for emergency costs have been provided alongside support in applying for the UIF's temporary uh, employee employee relief uh, scheme. So we're just guiding them uh, you know, in terms of navigating that space just to make sure that they meet all the UIF's uh, requirements. So our colleagues from post-investment a division will literally sit uh, and have virtual meetings like this with our investors and make sure that when they complete the forms that they have actually uh, duly complied with, with all the UIF's uh, requirements. To support business that have no working capital to trade post lockdown, the NEF has helped make, uh, make representations on behalf of our investors to access the CIFA debt relief fund the UIF distress fund, as well as the DTIC incentive schemes. Operational turnarounds are being undertaken by the NEF's turnarounds, workouts, and restructuring unit to assist businesses in distress. And lastly, companies that are insolvent, unable to pay their loans, according to approved terms, the NEF's turnaround and workouts a unit and the post-investment unit of the NEF are helping to restructure the balance sheets and loans of those of those particular companies. Slide 24, as a measure to provide relief to existing clients, the NEF will grant 47% of existing investees a loan repayment holiday for a period of up to three months, which will uh, be reviewed on an ongoing basis. This is to help safeguard the sustainability of the businesses whose operations have been affected by the lockdown this will amount to a total 30 million postpone, postpone, postponement in capital, uh, in capital repayments. In addition, the NEF will also grant a zero rating on interest for these eligible investees over the same period, which will result in a total 20 million benefit for the, for the, NEF, for the NEF clients. So the total package honorable members uh, amounts to 50 million, and these concessions will ensure that when the lockdown is lifted, the businesses are not confronted by the debt uh, obligations. So the rest, um, Chairperson, is just a summary of on slide 25, just to say the total value of all these measures, um, you know, is approximately uh, 50 million. So which means the total package that is coming from the NEF as a response to, to COVID-19 pandemic is estimated at um, 250 million rands. And lastly, um, in response, um, Chairperson, to the socioeconomic and human humanitarian challenges caused by the pandemic, we have also um, a partnered with a company called Miropa Gaming and Entertainment in Limpopo, where the NEF, uh, through a company that was funded by the NEF, is called Hosiami, where the NEF. Um, um, uh, which was led by the regional uh, manager in Limpombo, Mr. Uh, Selvin Naika, has actually delivered 1,500 food hampers to the rural communities in Limpombo. Further, we are pleased, which is the last slide, Chairperson, to report that as part of the NEF COVID-19 uh, Community Solidarity Fund, the 163 staff uh, members of the NEF have raised the amount of 1.4 million collectively, 
and I have already mentioned a uh, chairperson that we were actually supported by Bidvest, which has actually talked this amount or made a contribution of 2 million directly to the NEF. So over the last week, as I have already mentioned, we actually supplied food parcels to 3,392 house households. The total number is 4,000 households, uh, Chairperson. So we'll be finishing the other areas we haven't been to next week. So we've been to the Eastern Cape rural areas. The colleagues will remind me uh, you know, about the exact names of those villages. We were in KZN, we were in Pumalanga, we were in Northern Cape, and the households were identified in conjunction with the National Social Development Department. Thank you, Chairperson. Oh, by the way, Chairperson, you can see the slides uh, where the NEF was delivering uh, the, food, the food parcels. Can you go back? Just one minute. You can go back. Okay, can you go forward? Those are all the communities in different um, areas of the country. I wanted to show you, honorable members, my picture where I was also there, you can see the lady there with a, a, a wheelbarrow. That was, uh, that was the CEO of the National Empowerment Fund. Uh, and we decided with the executives to be actually part of this uh, initiative. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, CEO. Can, can I then actually ask the honorable members uh, to take Chair? Chair, for clarity or comments, uh, Andre? Chair, yeah. Chair, Mr. followed by Ms. Yaku, Chair. Uh, Mr. Okay, Kuk that's Kuk Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, my first question to the CEO is, could you please clarify our opening comments um, in relation to other funds that are providing uh, or shall I say, providing funds during this particular time, Chair. She seems to have made a, a comment, and I'd just like her to clarify that. And then, Chair, uh, you know, the triple B, double E mandate aside, does the uh, CEO think that it's conscionable that certain black workers are going to lose their jobs because their bosses happen to be white and are not able to access funding during this particular time? And then my last question, Chairperson, is that are you able as a NEF beneficiary then to benefit from the SMME Debt Relief Fund as well as the Tourism Fund if you tick all of those relevant boxes, Chair? Thank you. Okay. The next Ms. Yaku, one. Chair. Ms. Yaku. Yaku. Um, thank you. Thank you. To, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you to CEO for the presentation. Um, as much as I really do want to support you, um, I'm a bit concerned with this um, presentation of today. Um, there, there are lots of areas that I'm unhappy with, but I just don't know how to express it. Um, with your, your, you said you've done uh, 12 approvals um, in the space, but you've also put up your turnaround times in terms of from application to approval. And for me, it just doesn't add up. And also, I'm unhappy with the spread geographically of the companies that you've approved. And I'm wondering what services those companies provide. And I know you've named them, but I, I would like to hear from you predominantly what do they provide such that they deserve to be prioritized. And um, with regards to your CSI contribution, thank you for giving out food puzzles. I think our people really need that. Um, However, is there any way maybe that we, uh, especially as a as a, a black empowerment uh, um, uh, entity, uh, think outside the box in terms of not just giving our people food parcels, but looking at the long run because the grocery will run out. So what will happen then in months to come? And the last question I want to ask: What's your projection on 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 the many companies um, that that might perhaps not make the time as the COVID? Um, it's gonna it's gonna take us time to recoup from what is happening at the moment. I don't think two months is enough to give a company reprieve. So how do you how do you estimate maybe companies that are going to make a loss for you as as, as an investor? Thank you. Can I take the next one, Andre? Andre, you muted. Ms. Mutahu. Mutahu. <laughs> Mutahu, oh. I'm sure. Muted Thanks, Chef. Yeah, okay. 
Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, let me welcome the presentation and applaud the NEF with the good work that they have done, especially under NEF COVID-19 Community Solidarity Fund by supporting vulnerable citizens. Uh, I have only two questions. Uh, CEO, one, on your Black Business Fund, some companies are getting 10 million and others are getting less as per their operational requirements. Is there no possibility of putting a ceiling on a relief fund to at least give 5 million to one business so that businesses can be covered with uh, the little resources as opposed to funding few companies with more money? Uh, second question. Uh, what measures has the department put in place to ensure that applications for NEF funding are fast-tracked, given the immediate need while making sure that the process remains transparent and credible? Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Chair, Can we take please. next Mr. one? Mumbuyani? Yeah. Mr. Mumbuyani. Mumbuyani. Honorable Mumbuyani. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Good afternoon once again. Yeah, let me welcome the presentation by the NEF uh, and also welcome the Partnership for Community Society. Uh, the temper that she spoke about, it really interested people. Uh, Chairperson, I just want to check, man, in terms of the small business development reported, uh, the possibilities of consolidating the CIFA, the CIDA, and the NEF. So I just want to check what does the consolidation entails and uh, what is the update on the process of consolidating these three uh, small entities. Chairperson, there's Black Business Fund here. And I just hear they spoke of geographical spread and they only picked three big around South Africa. I just want to check if that geographical spreading into the three big cities, Chobe, Cape Town, and Devon, which constitute the three provinces. Chairperson, thank you very much. Okay. Chair, thank you. The next Mr. one. Mwatse. Mwatse. Honorable Mwatse. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Okay. Uh, I had I had uh, the CEO talking about uh, the loan repayment holiday from April to June 2020. Will there be a possibility, informed by analysis of COVID-19 pandemic and lockdown, to extend the payment holiday period? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Chairperson, Mr. Thring. Honorable Thring. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, my first comment is, is essentially just to do with the presentations itself. Uh, this presentation was absolutely perfect on my screen. Um, the previous presentation I could hardly see. Um, other presentations I don't see at all, which is why I have to follow on my laptop. So I don't know whether the challenge is with the IT or with my device, but now it's absolutely Absolutely perfect. So it seems that there's no problem with my device. Uh, if we could just look into that, I think it will be helpful, Chair. Um, so my question no, is on the you, life Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. My question is now, Chair, in the, in the yeah. light of the opening statement of the Freedom Charter, uh, which says, we the people of South Africa declare for all of our country and the world to know that South Africa belongs to all who are living it, black and white, and that no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. Um, can the CEO justify and clarify how the uh, 200 million from the uh, DTI for the COVID-19 Black Business Fund uh, supports the opening statement of the Freedom Charter? Second, um, can the finance department of NEF clarify? Uh, no, I think that has been clarified, the deficit of some 367 million. So. I think in a presentation she actually did that. Um, Chair, the challenge with slide 19 shows actually differing figures that pie chart on the geographical spread. Um, it, it shows some 
Um, it says 43% for Gauteng, 34% for Western Cape, and 23% for KwaZulu Natal. That's in the table on the side. But the pie chart actually has differing percentages. So which percentages are correct? So if the uh, CEO can just clarify that. Yeah. And then finally, Chair, like that. noting that the NEF's 1.4 billion exposure and only 25% of supported companies are operational due to the lockdown. As I post to the CEO of IDC, what is the CEO's opinion or recommendation, if any, as to when the lockdown restriction should be removed? Thank you, Chair. Okay, Chair. Yes. Ms. Magtashe. Honorable Mantashe. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, I want to follow suit uh, and walk in the footsteps of my, my colleagues from the African National Congress branch, uh, benches. In this Chair, Chair, I applaud the NEF status for ensuring that they really stick to their mandate as an entity that is seized with, with a transformation agenda. So transformation means that they have to make, to maintain the balance, you know, uh, because we are not equal and it, it will take time for any of us to, to, to be in an equal footing, percent. So I applaud them for maintaining that, for maintaining their agenda of supporting in particular small businesses which are unfortunately most of them run by black people and i am very happy that people understand what the freedom charter says and they must read it in totality uh, so that they understand what it says today i just want to check the funding that they distribute to, to assist black businesses to which provinces exactly is, is there a balance of distribution of assistance to all provinces? Because we have seen uh, that departments and entities, most of them concentrate on three uh, provinces. Okay. I understand they, they, tell, they tell us that it is because they are the economic no, nodes. It can't be mm -hmm. like that. You know, deliver, service delivery strategy must change so that we can also improve the economic status of those provinces that are not Bura. economic nodes, Chair. I want to check if the funding distributed to small businesses that have been supported because they are uh, under stress during this time around, is there a balance between provinces of the support? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Honorable Mantasha, you are so clear, and I'm also happy that Honorable Trin can see the presentation better. <laughs> so it looks like things are getting better, hopefully. Uh, Andre, is there somebody as, as well as as well as read the uh, the Freedom Charter, Chair? <laughs> <laughs> well, reading of the Freedom Charter, Mantasha should be able to assist you. We are very, <laughs> yeah, yeah, very happy that we are very happy yeah. that Honourable Tring recognizes that there's a document called the Freedom Charter. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I've been read, and I've been reading it from 1980, Chair, when I was in Australia. Thank you. Well, I'm just saying, it Rich. looks like things are improving. I'm quite happy and excited. Are there any further Chair? comments or questions? Andre? No more questions, Chair. We can proceed <laughs> with the answers. Okay. Can I actually go back to the CEO and the team just for the questions and comments that we have actually got? Uh, CEO? Um, thank you, um, Honorable Chairperson um, and Honorable Members for the for the. Um, questions and the issues that you have just raised. I will allocate the question, uh, the other questions to my other colleagues. Um, Mrs. Ma Katini Shengue will deal with um, the issues that were raised by Honorable um, Yako um, regarding the approval uh, time. Uh, what are these other companies that we have supported? What are they um, providing application to approval? That whole process, uh, Shengwe, why have we only done um, 12 approvals so far, which is, is a, a, an amazing experience, uh, you know, a, as far as the NEF is concerned, given the very short turnaround times that we've been given in terms of implementing uh, this fund. So I will start with um, um, 
the issues that were raised by um, Honorable Kadbe. That okay. uh, is there any effort? Are we not worried about the possibility that some of the black work workers, um, you know, will will lose their jobs? Um, um, especially um, if you look at the fact that we are now um, prioritizing black-owned uh, enterprises. Um, you know, as I said when I started my presentation, Honorable Kavets, we are, you know, in a very privileged um, position as the National Empowerment Fund in that we are the only DFI that has the exclusive responsibility of supporting black people. So our, our agenda and uh, our mandate is, uh, is about solely making sure that black people benefit, you know, from the South African economy. So if black workers who are employed by white um, companies are going to be losing their jobs, so surely we'll be worried about that. So I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the context of your question, but Anything that is black uh, is what will actually give us sleepless nights um, in this country. So if there's anything we can do is the National Empowerment Fund to make sure that those white businesses who are employing black people, that they actually don't retrench them. I'm sure if we had the opportunity, we'll actually do everything in our power to support those white companies as well. So that would be my response. Um, um, if the SME um, or if the <coughs> if our companies, the companies that have been supported by the NEF, that was your other question, Honorable Cuthbert, if they can also benefit from the other funds, the answer is yes, because these different funds, they actually provide different relief measures, right? So others will say like the UIF that they can have they can assist with the payment of the salaries. Um, others, um, it's actually to help with the working capital requirements, and there's a long list. So what the NEF has done is to actually assess each and every one of those different components because, for instance, the NEF, you'll find that in other instances, depending on the type of investment you are looking at, that sometimes we actually can't assist with the payment of the salaries, even though we'll be saying there's a moratorium, there's an interest rate repayment, a holiday, and so on. You'll find that when it comes to the actual, um, you know, disbursement of cash, just to make sure that those companies are sustained, that the NEF will not have those resources. So I'm just saying that, yes, the answer is yes, you can also qualify for those other small portions uh, of funding from other, you know, fund, uh, funding relief measures that are provided by other organizations. You said, uh, Honorable Chairperson, I made a comment. I can't remember the comment that you are referring to. Then uh, the question that was raised by Honorable uh, Yaku uh, will be dealt with uh, by um, Shengwe. So he, she also, um, I think Honorable Yako again, wanted to know what will be the long-term view that the NEF will be taking, especially when making the distributions, that we need to come up with a long-term, um, you know, sustainability measures as opposed to just providing food parcels. I think the NEF does both, uh, Chairperson and Honorable Members, because we provide both uh, your long-term, medium-term uh, <clears throat> solutions. So we do this by providing, so the financial support that we actually provide to, to the entities and the non-financial support that we provide to the entities that have been funded by the NEF is a clear demonstration that the NEF is not just worried about the food parcel. You know, it's, we are actually much bigger than just providing the food parcels. But the reason why we decided to join forces and actually join other organizations like the Solidarity Fund that was announced by the president is because we are seeing the need on the ground. So honorable members, I don't know where most of you live, but when you go to the rural areas, people uh, don't have anything to eat. So that is the reality. 
as to whether this will sustain them for four months or five months, it's a question for another day. But for now, when our people are saying they are kids who are working for, hotel, for hotels, uh, working at some of these big hotels, uh, working at some of the hospita hospitality industries in South Africa, that their kids are no longer working. So there's no source of income. So if you can provide a food parcel, but let's make sure that it's a food parcel that will sustain them for a very long period, especially you know when you look at the need on the ground. So we're doing both long-term, medium-term, and the short-term response that we are providing through the food parcels that um, uh, I was referring to. So you're saying, so what happens after um, you know, uh, two months? Um, we'll take it back to the board. So they are saying, the board was saying the immediate relief measures, so that will last for another three to six months. So what happens beyond that? So we, <coughs> we have also submitted um, the National Treasury as all the DFIs to both big DFIs and small DFIs to submit their proposals on their immediate uh, financial needs. Uh, there is something that has gone to the Minister of DTIC and the National Treasury. But we are very happy to report that for now, as we currently speak, we have also been able to give back to, to our investment companies. And then I'm moving on to Honorable Mudao. Um, oh, Honorable Mudao wanted to know why are we not maybe out of the 10 million rent threshold that we are providing? Uh, she has realized that other companies are getting um, a small amount of uh, 1 million rent, or 2 million, 500,000, 900,000, and, and others will get the full 10 million. So she was asking, why are we not maybe um, dicing the 10 million rent uh, up so that from the 10 million, uh, we can make sure that as many companies can benefit as opposed to just giving them one company 10 million. I would take a, um, a different view um, that says, uh, Honorable Mudao, that we should be saying, why is the ceiling for black companies 10 million? We should be saying, why don't we increase that amount to 20 million? Because we shouldn't, when we think about black companies, when we think about uh, DFIs that are providing support to black owned enterprises, we should not be thinking small all the time. In terms of size, yes, maybe. But when we think about black companies, let's think big as well. Let's think about how we're going to build, gonna build black companies to become black industrialists so that they don't get 10 million, they can qualify for 50 million and so on. So I'll take a different view. But obviously, this is my uh, personal view on the role of black business uh, in the South African economy, that Bitvest is helping the NEF would like to see a black owned company one day that would be of the same size and reach as Bitvest. So, well, I, I may have a different uh, take on those matters. The process, make sure that uh, the process uh, is transparent. That's what we've been uh, doing, which is why I spoke about the committee, special committee of the board that was set up that has an oversight responsibility on this fund. It has officials uh, from senior officials from the DTIC. It has the board members. It has the NEF executives and so on. So it doesn't get any uh, transparent than what the NEF has done. Honorable Mbuyani, you said I should uh, comment on the consolidation of CEDA, CIFA. Um, unfortunately, um, Honorable Mbuyane, um, we have not been informed about that matter. The matter that we are, are working on, uh, which is based on what we have already presented to the committee, is the matter of the NEF and IDC. Remember, uh, we the committee, the very same committee, uh, did a lot of detailed work on how this matter will actually, um, you know, pan out. Uh, what does it mean, you know, which sectors the IDC or NAF would focus on. So we are only hearing about this other cons consolidation, um, you know, from the, the major of CEDA, CIFA and NAF. 
from the corridors. So I thought Honorable Mboyane is our political um, uh, and uh, our MP uh, representatives, uh, that will be better place to actually inform us about the new measure. Whether maybe we are thinking of splitting the NEF into two, there's one part that must go to CEDA, CIFA, and another part to IDC. We are as confused as, as you are. And um, unfortunately, our shareholder ministry doesn't know anything about this measure as well. Geographic spread, um, why KZN, Western Cape. So what we have done so far, because of the huge um, you know, um, demand and the need uh, out there, what we've been doing is actually a demand-driven approach. We look at the, at the transactions that have been presented to the, to the NEF. So if, let's say, you are in the Northern Cape, we do the adverts, everybody knows about the fund now, and you don't submit the application to the NEF. Unfortunately, because of the huge uh, need that we have in the country, we can't go to the Northern Cape and say, please create something that doesn't exist, because it has to be companies that are already operational in this particular space. Um, and then, um, Honorable Muazi, um, talking about the loan repayment holiday period, that it should be the possibility of extending the period. I'll give that question uh, to the chairperson of the NEF, because it has to be a board decision. I hope he's still uh, on the line. If not, Shlengi, uh, where the divisional executive will uh, take it. Um, Honorable Krill on the um, Freedom uh, Charter and whether I believe the 200 million supports the objective um, of the Freedom Charter. In fact, uh, Honorable Member, when, when I read the Freedom Charter and look at the, um, of the, at the objectives of uh, the National em Empowerment Fund, and look at the rationale for establishing the fund in the first instance, for me, it's actually very much aligned with what uh, you know, was actually encapsul encapsulated um, in the Freedom Chat. So which is why, honorable members, sometimes when I hear uh, our honorable members um, actually telling us about all the different measures that are supposed to happen. So how do you take something that was exclusively set up for the benefit, exclusive benefit of black people. Then we are now thinking of doing this, changing this, chopping, changing. This is the only entity that can be taken to the constitutional courts because of providing support to black people. Any other entity that can sit up today um, and actually say, oh, we're setting aside something for 51% black owned enterprises there is always a potential risk there that that particular fund or that particular facility can actually be questioned when you actually take it to the constitutional court. It's the only fund. So when the minister allocated 200 million, nobody can take the NEF or the minister to the constitutional court for having actually uh, allocated a small portion. You know, if you look at all the other funds, it's a small portion that has been given to the national employment uh, when you actually compare it with what has been given to other um, entities that are dealing with billions of friends. Geographical spread, uh, we will deal with that. 25%, um, um, whether I believe that the, the restrictions should be removed um, uh, when the lockdown uh, is over. We're all, uh, we are all, um, We are all um, a chairperson, um, obviously, um, as concerned as the, as the other members uh, are um, about the possibility of actually lifting some of those restrictions. They are affecting all of us. They are affecting our companies and so on. So I think the, the MPs will be better placed to, to, re, to actually respond to that particular question. Honorable Mantashe. Uh, that we need to balance uh, in terms of the dis distribution. Um, let's, um, so that's what we've been doing, uh, Honorable Mantash. That's what we've been doing. That's what the NEF is seized with. If you look at our contributions, 
We are working with the Solidarity Fund. We made a contribution there, but we thought as the NEF, we also want our reach to be felt. So to the fund, Solidarity Fund, we co contributed 500,000. And then we went to Bidvest and said, um, you as a company, Bidvest, you have never really been to like deep, deep rural areas. And they have really, really enjoyed working with the NEF because they are saying we took them to the areas that uh, they never thought one day they will end up uh, going to those areas. And in terms of our SMME support, I think, Honorable Mantash, that's what um, the NEF um, has actually made an undertaking to do in all our invested portfolio. This is the work that the NEF has been assisted with. Uh, I'll hand over to Shengi. Well, thank you, Chairperson, and MZ, just to take and the Chairperson. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. I'd uh, like to just respond on uh, uh, Rakesh Garat. I'm the Chairperson of the Board of the NEF. Uh, the point that the CEO made around can we extend the, the relief and the uh, the payment holidays beyond three months, I think as much as we'd like to, we're going to uh, have to be forced into reality. Uh, we obviously don't want any of our investees to collapse uh, or, or, or be liquidated. So as a board, uh, we will have to look at this very strategically, but we don't have unlimited funds. Uh, I think at the very start of the presentation, the CEO put up some of our available funding. Um, and we will we, we'll be uh, tied in terms of what we can provide, but we obviously we'd like to stretch our rand as much as possible. Um, we, we're hoping that um, the Minister of Finance is able to, to extend his hand uh, or, or into his pocket again and see if there's some availability for, for more concession funding that we can, um, that we can tap into. Obviously, with these investees, we also encouraging them to work with their primary banker who uh, uh, in the uh, financial services industry to see if they can access the, the, the guarantee scheme that was announced by the Reserve Bank. Um, and that's uh, 100 billion rands at the moment. So, so maybe that we could help them with source alternative uh, avenues for funding if we're not able to provide direct funding. I trust that that answers the question. The, the next contributions, um, there were other uh, colleagues which were invited by the CEO to comment. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair, and good afternoon to the honorable members and thank you, CEO and, and, and Chair of the NEF. Uh, so I'm, I'm answering the questions from uh, Honorable Member Yako on, on the approval rate, um, given the, the, the turnaround plans that we have committed to um, as the NEF. Um, so I just wanted to take a step back here and, and, and remind the Honorable Members that at the NEF, uh, we have, as part of our strategy, um, to handhold and, and, and assist um, entrepreneurs when they approach us for funding. So although, um, you know, we have set those turnaround times for ourselves, that's with um, the assumption that the clients or the entrepreneurs have given us all the required information for the assessments to be done, for the due diligence to be finalized, and for the, for the uh, transaction to then be presented to the uh, approving committee. So when the, when the clients come to us and the information is not complete, we do not turn them away. We work with them, we guide them, we help them. You know, some of the clients uh, will have problems with, with getting their uh, tax clearance certificates from SARS. We will help them to engage with SARS and, and, and so forth. So in, 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 in our view and, you know, understanding the complexity of the, of the entrepreneurs that we deal with, their ability to provide information, some of the entrepreneurs are trying to acquire equipment from overseas, we have to help them engage with those overseas suppliers and so forth. We, we think that, you know, the NEF is, is working very hard to give very good uh, turnaround because, Chair, of the 78 million rents that has been approved by the NEF, over 60 million rents has already been dispersed. So the entire end-to-end uh, -end process, we're trying very hard to make sure that 
uh, the transactions are commercially viable, they will be able to repay the money that the government is investing, and 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 and, and that's so the risks are properly uh, identified and mitigated. But we don't just have approvals, but we approve and implement those transactions. So the clients uh, don't just have approvals. Uh, about 60 million rand has already been uh, invested in, in in those transactions. So um, I think, Chair, that's that's the answer to why 12. Uh, we have assessed over 300 transactions, applications. And as the CEO was saying earlier on, some of those are people are taking chances. Some of them have nothing to do uh, with the manufacturing of, of either the, 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 the medical, um, you know, um, products that are required or the, the essential food items. And we have to respond to, to all of them. So, yeah. Okay, I think uh, we, 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 we're doing the best under the circumstances. Okay. Yeah, are there any further uh, contributions from- the... Thank you, Chair Percy. Yes. If you can introduce yourself when you speak- Yes, yes Chair Percy, please. The floor is yours. Yes. This is Mzi Daimani. Okay. So, uh, I, I... I just want to talk about the, the geographical spread uh, question. So on that particular issue, we fully agree with the members of the committee that we need more transactions in the provinces that are less developed. And we are co constantly on the lookout for those projects. We go into those provinces on a constant basis. I, for one, for instance, I'm from the Eastern Cape and I'm there on a regular basis looking for transactions. and it is actually not as easy to find those transactions. And in the past, we have financed transactions there and we continue supporting them. But in order to conceptualize transaction in some of the provinces is a long-term project. And we actually, if you look in the COVID fund, the transactions that have been approved because the fund focuses on manufacturing only. So the transactions that are financed through the fund are transactions where those entities are manufacturing. They have been in the three provinces, but our teams are in the provinces working on projects that we can actually source from the other provinces as well. So the NEF is indeed a national organization. Thank you. All right. Um, are there any further comments, CEO, if we can come back to you? If ever you, you have actually covered the uh, comments, or are there still colleagues who would like to talk? CEO? Chair, um, I think we have um, covered um, most of the of the issues that um, that have been raised by the by the honourable um, members. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say that. Um, the earlier point um, of what we're actually looking for, the, the issue of the intervention you are making as NEF in the provision of food parcel, it's very important. So on our part, we're actually taking a view, and I think maybe it's a general kind of sense of trying to get the balance that in the spaces that we know, because with the three provinces that uh, are covered or have some feedback of what you support, it's provinces where we think on areas of township economy, rural economy, we may not be able to get you to penetrate that space because that's where you think you are more required to help you know, stabilize and grow those small economies in terms of those township and rural areas. So that's why we will actually then always have the issue coming up on the provinces that may be seen to be benefiting a lot, but those who are actually having rural areas. So I think there might be a capacity issue, I think, with the... Uh, Honor, uh, Mr. Diamond uh, raising the point of saying we can't get those who actually could come forward with proposals which will help us look at that small local economic development. So let me say the, the, the point as well in numbers, 
you might find that there's no disagreement, CEO, of saying 10 million rands, but the idea was actually to say few big ones and actually small ones, many small ones, comparatively speaking. You might find that we make more impact or have more access uh, if we actually have many small successful. It's not compared or against one big one, but I think the point and idea is to say, if you grow the local economy and there are many successful small businesses in terms of development, we think we might actually be doing more uh, in terms of impact of development in the space. So it's just a, a, a point where we support what we're doing as a committee, but we're actually thinking we can look at how we improve the space and actually go, get more participative environment of those who actually are going to get involved in business. And we think small business is actually the core of local economic development in terms of actually your support. We're not against actually big businesses being supported, but we have seen uh, some of the big ones really not being able to assist us to grow to a point that those uh, local, small, and actually rural areas are getting the benefit of economic development and growth. So I thought maybe let me just make that comment, uh, uh, CEO there. That's the comment I was actually uh, saying. One is actually saying the, the input that we have actually given really would have to uh, help us understand that uh, with the capacity you have, because you do have capacity, what we know that might be more important is that there can be more resources or money made available for you to help us implement. So, CEO, can I give you, uh, unless there are comments chair. from members or questions? Yeah, uh, Chair, Ms. Yaku. Okay. Uh, are there other members which actually uh, want to comment or ask questions? So only Ms. Yaku. Only... Okay. Can I take Yaku and then maybe go back to you, CEO, to be able to actually get you to round up? Yaku. Thank you, Chairperson. I think you've covered me in, in, in what I wanted to say, because I think uh, the CEO is coming off very defensive. And um, I think she misunderstands that our right is to oversee. It's oversight. So we have to flag things that we have issues with. And I think the food, the food parcels is a very noble thing to do. Obviously, people are hungry. We know that people are hungry. And mine was to say, perhaps, as, 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 as an entity that's interested in black growth, Maybe let us look at other ways in which we can give back to the people. It's not to say you're not doing your job. So I'm a bit baffled by the reaction. And I think Ms. Um, I think Kengi, where she covered me well in explaining why there are only 12, um, 12 approvals so far. And that is what I was looking for. And I think she needs to understand that ours here is to oversee. We're not, we're not always going to agree, but ours, even when we disagree, we're actually trying to understand better and to grow as one. That is all, Chairperson. Thank you. And then you agree with me when I say food parcel provision is very important intervention. And then of doing course. that, we support that yeah. fully and we think we can actually, not to say they can do more, what they're doing is excellent. We, we have to um, do that. I think you're trying to mold my words, but what I've said is that I've said what I wanted to say, um, that it's a good thing to give back. Food parcels are good because people are hungry. Let us look at other ways also. It's not to say that's null and void. It's not, it's not work that's done. We appreciate it. I'm sure those families also appreciate it. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Can I go back to CEO and uh, we can actually round up CEO because it was comments on our side just on the basis of the discussion we are having. CEO? So, um, thank you. Thank you, Chair Pesson. Um, so, let me apologize to Honorable Yaku if I came across um, in that way. Um, I've been with this uh, committee for quite some time now. Um, it's not 
my style or nature to be defensive. I've always tried to provide as much information as possible to the honorable members. So if I came across uh, in that way, honorable uh, Yaku, I would like to, to apologize uh, profusely uh, to you, but you are saying uh, you are happy with, with the response that uh, you have received from my colleague. So Chairperson, coming back to your issues, so I think, uh, Chairperson, so what I will do uh, just as a way of providing additional information on the work that we are doing, um, you know, um, uh, around uh, this COVID-19 fund, so that you can get a sense of the types of, so if you are setting up a manufacturing plant that is looking at uh, the production of any of the um, products that have been listed by the DTIC and the Department uh, of Health, just to give you an estimate of how much will be required for people who are looking at becoming black industrialists within the healthcare space. So if you want to set up a plant, what, what, what sort of uh, capex will be required that would then allow you to produce the quality and the products that the government is referring to. But I fully, I fully uh, support your point. So which is why if you look at the funding in other sectors, I'm not talking about COVID fund now, uh, I think about 60% of our funding at NEF has actually gone towards providing support to SMEs. But if you look at the healthcare sector, it's just the nature uh, of you know, the sector that we're dealing with in that even if you wanted to provide a smaller amount, much smaller than the 10 million, but because you must set up, the, you need to buy the machinery, you must buy the equipment, there are those standards, SAPS standards that you must comply with. And, and unfortunately, that amount of money you will be required to actually um, to actually invest it in those businesses. But I hear you, especially if you look at the essential food stuff, uh, you know, transactions. In those transactions, I think Chairperson we will be able to, to you know, to dice it up um, as much as we can, just to make sure that we actually extend the reach uh, of the enterprises that, that we are looking at. So, and uh, I'd like to thank the committee and the Honorable Chairperson for actually um, giving us uh, this opportunity to share the, the work that the NEF has been doing in this space. Thank you, Chair. Okay, can I then, uh, my C CEO and the team, thank you for being available and actually sharing with us. I'm sure on the areas that we need to follow through, we'll give you, we, we'll, we'll get from you when we have an opportunity to meet again on how, what progress you're able to make. Uh, can I then um, uh, ask uh, that we, we, we just look at the uh, conclusion of this presentation then, Secretary, just to look at our next meeting uh, for the presentation of the NSF, uh, we have come to the conclusion. Thank you very much, CEO and the team. Secretariat, if I can actually Chair, just pick up on that. Yeah. With regard to next week's meetings, we have two scheduled meetings, one on Monday, the 18th of May, and one on Tuesday, the 19th of May. The one on Monday is an update by the DTI on the COVID-related matters. That's a two-weekly uh, meeting that we schedule as a committee. Um, that meeting will start at 12 o'clock, Chair, not 9 o'clock, as on the program, because I indicated last time that the times may change according to the scheduling that is given to us. The meeting on Tuesday, Chair, we will deal with the Competition Commission and the NCC, those are the focus areas for next week's chairperson. And that meeting starts at 9? Yeah, Tuesday morning would start at 9. But uh, like awesome. I said, Chair, we, we, we do get a schedule, and there may be slight changes in terms of time. I hope that time doesn't change, but if it do change, I will inform members timelessly, Chair. Okay. Can, can we actually then uh, uh, try and conclude our meeting? And uh, for the next meeting, I think... Uh, you will be sending a reminder, an update, obviously. Yes, and yeah. uh, for the purpose of today's meeting, we, we can conclude and thank all the members and those who actually participated for, for the support. Thank you very much. The, the meeting is adjourned.
Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Oh, it's good night, yeah. Good night. I want to stay oh, here. Thank you.
I am there, my chair president. Oh, you are there already. Chair president, you you there. got your team. Full force. I've got my team, chair president. Yes. Uh, the deputy minister is there as well. Corporate Robert. Corporate Obi. Uh, this meeting is scheduled for three hours. But we are we are going to take two hours. Thank you, Chaperson. By eight o'clock. Thanks, Chaperson. So that so that we afford you an opportunity to to do some basic stuff and. And thereafter, listen to the president because the president is addressing the nation at half past eight. Thanks, Chairperson. Which means that we are. Why are you making a decision on our behalf, National Chairperson of NSOP? Yes, yes. Why are you taking a decision on our behalf? Yes, I do that. Chairperson of NSOP, why are you taking a decision on our behalf for our members here? Okay, thank you. Why are you taking a decision on our behalf? I am I'm coordinating. I'm coordinating. I'm keeping up systems in place so that we must not battle when we start with the meeting. Okay. But, now, but we are now, out of order. We are out of now, order. Now, now, come on, Tabo. Tabo. It will be quite great that before we start with the meeting, you must assure your presentation no so that you must think right about to take the decision for some us. We are not properties here. Is that okay? It's fine, my chairperson. Yeah, no, wonderful. Chairperson of NSOP, we are out of order. We are out of order. We don't have powers to tell us what to do in the meeting. You must consult us as members. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine, Chairperson, but you are out of order. You can't take a decision on our behalf. You must consult with us. If, if I'm preparing my meeting so that things must be okay, if you, you have an objection to that, you will alert me in a very nice way, Comrade Shangi, my leader. Yeah, but you do it in a wrong way. You are not supposed to tell the chair of the MDP to say that you are going to finish a meeting later. You don't have those powers. Which powers? To take that decision and tell the chairperson that you are going to end this meeting at 8. Uh, so again, thanks to... yeah, yeah, but that is what I'm going to propose to you. If you say you know, it's up to you. And then yeah. you know, otherwise, but 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 he must be ready because his presentation might be too long, 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 and that he must be ready yeah. for that. Members, huh? I agree with you. We must yeah, the, 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 but, but but this matter is very trivial. It's very small. We we, we can deeper over such a small matter. It's small, very small. I and you have a tip on. Uh, your TV is on. No, it's not mine, man. Who? I don't know. No, it's, it's not my TV. Okay. Someone's TV is on. It's disturbing all of us.
Kenny, it's your TV that is on. I'm not using a TV. Uh, you know, in, in our organization, we are taught discipline. That's why I respect the people when I'm in the meeting. And I respect the meeting. I am within, uh, colleagues. You are within. I'm within. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see your face, uh, Honorable Chair. Yeah, you are going to see it now. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just on checking the register who's here and who's not here yet. So that All right, get that you. That as well. No problem. We have systems in place. All right. Come, 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 right. Honorable Faith. Honorable Faith Mutambi. Yes. Can you just quickly check? on this thing of the roll call where all our names appear as to how many people from the NA do we have in the meantime? Yeah, we always ready ourselves. Yeah, I will tell you, we have, we have a Hadebe with an H. Yes. Uh, Good. Hussein is here. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes, Kitab. thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Hello, Hussein. Hello, hello, Che. How are you? Then, a uh, pretty cab, Mam Kizay is here. Wonderful. Yeah, Che. Gizella Operman is here. I'm present. Our only one and only thing you are Khalifa is here. Good. Present Jefferson. Inkosile Tuli is here. Yes. Umegito is here. Now we form you. Yes, Che. In fact, on our side, we are full house, except full that there's an apology of uh, Honorable Khunerwald. Yes. Honorable yes. Khunerwald uh, sent an apology. I'm still okay. going to get the name of the Honorable member whom I was told was going to alternate. I'll tell you the name once I get to the other sister. If I can assist, it's it's Honourable Pluter from the NCOP. Uh, good afternoon, Honourable Dudu. Oh, how, um, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Honourable oh. Grunewald asked me to sit in for this meeting. Okay. Okay. Fine, you're welcome. Eh? Thank you very much. So, okay. I... On our part, NA side, we are here full, full house, all of us, as always. We are here. Yes, as always. As always. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Hello, Chairperson of MDB. Yeah. Uh, thanks, my Chairperson. Good it's evening. It's a pleasure to, to see you in this platform. Thanks, my Chairperson. Hello, Manioni, NC Deployee of Free State. <laughs> yes, the deployee from the Free State who's helping EFF. Hello, thank you, Thank you, Thank you, please stop catching feelings. 
Stop catching the feelings here. But I think you can be ungovernable, you know. How do you start? We are starting with a meeting now. Thank you very much, all of you, honorable members. Let me once more take this opportunity to heartily welcome all of you to, to this meeting. This is once more an important meeting, the joint committee meeting of the select committee and the portfolio committee of the National Assembly, where our focus today is on the Municipal Demarcation Board. As I indicated earlier on, informally, 